The 25th Hour Radio Show. I want to thank everyone for tuning in today to the 25th Hour Radio Show here on Monster Radio, AM 1150. I am your host, Rob Fairless, and on the phone with me today is visual artist and drummer for Leonard Skinner, Michael Cardellone. Michael, thanks for taking a few minutes out of your day to join me on the show. Thank you, Rob. I'm happy to be here. Now, Michael, a lot of people listening right now might be a little curious as to why I mentioned you being a visual artist when you're the drummer for Leonard Skinner. Uh, for someone who isn't aware of your background and, and second talent, I imagine they would think that the drumming holds preference uh, over yeah, the time, right? But that's not the you case. You might think. Yeah, that's not the case. You I mean, might, you really started painting years before picking up drumsticks, right? This is true. I was uh, in art school when I was four, painting, and began drumming when I was nine. But the long and short of it, really, Rob, is that both of these things have coexisted my entire life. And on any given day, I'm a drummer who paints or I'm a painter who drums. Now, in the very beginning, uh, did anyone ever say to you, hey, you're wasting your time trying to master two skills. You just need to focus on, on one. No, no. In fact, it was the opposite. Uh, um, I had nothing but support because I was just truly engrossed in, in two things that I loved that, for me, uh, not only fed off of each other, they enhanced each other and balanced each other. I, I simply can't imagine life just playing drums or just painting. For me, they are two halves of a whole. Now, how did you first pick up painting? I was uh, in kindergarten, and apparently the teacher noticed some type of skill, I suppose, and mentioned to my parents they might want to encourage that. So the summer after kindergarten, uh, my parents enrolled me in this summer course at the Cleveland, uh, Cleveland, Ohio is my hometown, Mm -hmm. the Cleveland Institute of Art. And I took a summer course as a four-year-old kid in, (laughs) in an art institute, most of which went over my head. But, um, you know, that began a lifelong journey. So not long after that, a few years, you're still young, you picked up drumming, right? That's right. Um, And the short story there is I had an older cousin, his name's Bert, who uh, is a great drummer. And every time we would visit, I would beg him to play his kit. Every now and then he would say yes. My parents saw how fixated I was, and they um, signed me up for drum lessons. Basically, I I haven't stopped either since. Now on your bio here, I'm reading... It says by the time you were in high school, you were making a living from playing the drums. When did you first start making money from your artwork? Um, I sold my first painting while I was still in high school, now that I remember. So, uh, again, they, the, the music and the visual art really, r- really were neck and neck my, my entire life. Now, the drumming went to the forefront as the career solidified, uh, specifically with, with Dan Yankees, but even then I was painting and, and never stopped. Now, what surprised you most, or maybe better yet, how to say this is, what excited you most, that you can make a living from either art or drumming? Um, you know, frankly, I was, I was uh, 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 thankful that I made any money doing either. Yeah. Because a career in the arts in any in any form is an uphill battle. So it really just comes down to if you have this desire to create in in any form of the art and you must do it, then you do it. You just do it because it's who you are and you need to release it. And if there are people that like it enough to support it, then then it's that much better. Okay, so you make the move to New York. Uh, you're working in the art department in the garment industry during the day. Uh, you're playing the That's drums right. at night. To someone That's right. who hasn't ever done something like that, it seems like it would be uh, exhausting 
I mean, how were you able <laughs> to keep up that pace, you know, without burning out? I was uh, 22 years old, and I didn't need a lot of sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, how does that change, was, right, when you get older? <laughs> amen. Amen. Wild youth. Wild youth. Yeah. No, it's funny, because I was, um, I was working at that, uh, that job in the garment industry, and I like to call that painting bunnies, because I was basically painting bunnies and duckies uh, for a children's clothing company. It's kind of funny. And, um, and during that time, I auditioned for Tommy Shaw, who was putting together a solo band. And I got a phone call one day at, the, at my day job from Tommy's manager saying, you need to take a leave of absence because you're going out on tour with Tommy and his band. And next week, you're playing Madison Square Garden, <laughs> opening for Rush. Wow. And I am not exaggerating. It was completely baptism by fire. Um, and it was an amazing experience. I like to ask this question to a lot of artists, uh, musicians. Where were you the first time you heard yourself playing on the radio? Do you remember? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I was still living in Cleveland. Um, and I had, um, I had been in a band... Uh, back in the early 80s, an all-original band called Boy Wonder. And we were um, eh, kind of kind of like the police stylistically, if I had to pinpoint. Mm -hmm. And um, that band was a, um, was a, uh, uh, a part of the, the Cleveland music scene when, it, when people were just trying to write material and release it independently. And, um, and that band actually did well in Cleveland and got a, um, a fair amount of airplay. So that's the first time I heard myself on the radio. So how did you feel when you heard yourself? Who did you tell first? Oh, um, if memory serves, um, my parents. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's just, it's surreal, you know, because this is something you dream of. And when it actually happens, it's pretty bizarre. Absolutely. Now, you've played with yeah. some big bands in your career, uh, recorded with a ton of well-known artists, uh, but how did you get this gig with Skinner, man? How, how did this opportunity come about for you? Well, during uh, Damn Yankees, which, of course, Tommy Shaw and I were a part of, um, you, uh, you know, once you get out on the road, you start running into a lot of people, um, whether it's your you know, uh, on the same bill at a concert or you're staying at the same hotel or whatever the case may be. And, and one night we were playing in Jacksonville and Johnny Van Zandt came backstage. And, um, uh, I, I vividly remember meeting Johnny because of course, you know, who wasn't a Skinner fan? I mean, I certainly played a lot of Skinner tunes when I was in high school and in basement bands. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then over the course of the years, I would run into the Skinner guys quite often. So um, I already knew them. And uh, fast forwarding to 1998, mm -hmm. uh, they were recording the album Edge of Forever. The man that was producing it, named Ron Nevison, was also Dan Yankee's producer. He invited me down to the studio. Um, they hired me to play percussion on that record um, and then asked me to join the band. In some ways, it was um, just because of the networking of the music business and then also kind of right place at the right time. Now, has being a member of Leonard Skinner affected you in any way as far as your artwork career? I mean, you guys are always in high demand, and it seems like, you know, Skinner's always on tour. I mean, do you still paint during the day and play drums at night? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I carry art supplies on tour, and um, this can be seen, actually, uh, on, my, on my website, which is michaelcardelloni.com. There are a few different paintings. One uh, specifically is, uh, is a portrait of Ronnie Van Zandt. And on the website, you can see that painting move from hotel room to hotel room and come to fruition. Uh, I paint every day. Um, it, it's, 
it's a great way for me just to stay, um, I don't know, uh, um, uh, creatively fed with the visual art during the course of a tour. Because, you know, the, the touring, as wonderful as it is, is kind of like that movie Groundhog Day. You know, we, we do the same thing over and over and over. It's just the city changes. So for me to sit in a hotel room and paint for a couple hours that afternoon, it's incredibly uh, important. It really helps me just kind of stay balanced. Now, you actually have some of your artwork pieces that's going to be featured in an upcoming event in January, right? That's right. Uh, Wentworth Gallery that I've been working with for several years now, um, I'm doing two shows with them in January, uh, January 14 in Short Hills, New Jersey, and January 15 in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, which is a suburb of Philly. Now, I got a question for you. Do, you. do you have to actually be at the gallery to purchase your artwork? Because I went to the Wentworth Gallery website. Uh, I clicked on mm-hmm. your name on the homepage, and it took me to some of your pieces uh, that's going to be featured, but it says contact the gallery for pricing. How does that work? I mean, do people bid on your work? Is it a set price? How does that work? Uh, it, the, the prices are set, and um, they uh, um, just have people contact them directly, uh, be it over the phone or, or um, email-wise, and they do sales that way. Unless I'm doing a physical show, like the two in January that are coming up. Those shows, I will be there at the galleries. Um, All of the artwork will be hanging on the wall, and then it's a more brick-and-mortar approach. Now, how long will your work be featured there? They will have the work hanging up for a full month, but I'll only be there on the the one day. Yeah. So, So do you have your own favorite pieces that you've done that's going to be on display, or do they all... Or do they all have that little something that inspired you to create them? Well, I, I like to think that every one of the paintings has something that's that's a, a reflection of myself. So every every painting is important. But I do have a few that I maybe have a softer spot for. And um, uh, specifically, uh, I did a series of paintings called The Four Davids. And I took uh, Michelangelo's statue of David and I painted him in four different ways that uh, are influenced by four different um, periods of our history. And uh, these are very, very big paintings. Each one is four feet square and it was a pretty monstrous undertaking, but I'm very, very proud of those. Now, is it hard to let go of some of these pieces? I mean, have you ever sold a piece of artwork that you wish you might have, you know, had back? I would say in the early days it was it was challenging, but once you get over that hurdle, then you then you go into the frame of mind of, well, this is my business, and uh, you know, I I am painting to to further my you know, my presence in the art world. And, and by doing so, you, you know, you sell the original paintings. But I will tell you, Rob, that I have um, canvas reproductions of everything I've done. So even though the original painting might be hanging in someone's home, I still have, uh, you know, a copy of it um, when I need to see it. And just to reiterate, everyone can go to Wentworth Gallery dot com to see some of michael's artwork that's going to be on display and for sale uh you also connect with uh, your fans on social media i know you have a facebook page you have your own website which you mentioned uh just google michael's name and you'll find it uh do you enjoy being able to connect with fans through social media is that something you really get into you know i do enjoy it rob and i, I will tell you that um that i just finished a painting a few days ago and put it on my facebook page and it's really, really fun to just have immediate reaction and see how the, the work is being received. Because, you know, that, that, that painting won't be, you know, hanging on the gallery wall for a few weeks yet. So to have instant, you know, 
reaction is very, very satisfying. Now, is that are you just a Facebook fan? I mean, do you have other? Do you have Twitter? Do you do anything else on social media? Or are you mainly a Facebook guy? I've only used Facebook, um, and and I will tell you that I I don't spend a lot of time on it. Um, I, I really am just using it for business purposes. Yeah, I mean, you're a busy uh, man. <laughs> well, you know, I um, I, I do uh, fill my day uh, quite easily. And in fact, I've been sitting at my easel, which is what I'm sitting in front of right now, and I only put the paintbrush down to dial you. As wow. soon as we're as soon as we hang up, I'm picking the paintbrush brush back up again. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I hope I don't ruin your inspiration. That's for sure. <laughs> no, no, no. In fact, in fact, you, in fact, you've encouraged it. Thank you. That's cool. You know, and and Michael yeah. and and Leonard Skinner will be performing in our listening area on Saturday, February fourth, at the Carson Center in Paducah, Kentucky. Uh, if you haven't got your tickets yet, you better be acting pretty fast because if it isn't sold out uh, already, it will be soon. Michael, is there anything you might want to say or add before we wrap this up today? Uh, I would just um, like to thank all of uh, all of your listeners, all of the Skinner fans out there. You know, the band really does feel like this is just one big family. You know, we we are all Skinner fans. We all love that music, and you know, we feel very honored getting to play that music every night. And the fact that people are enjoying it the way they are makes it um, just incredibly satisfying. So I guess I would just, I just want to say thank you. Well, Michael, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today, and I wish you nothing but the best moving forward in life, sir. Thank you so much, Rob. Radio Show. Show.